Okay, uh, thank you for this chance to present my research. This work is done in close co collaboration with Costas, uh, Gregoriatas, Reiner, Hollerbach, and Toby Wood. Um, so I'll start with introducing neutron star briefly. Uh, so if you have a massive star, uh, at the end of its evolution, it goes into a supernova. And in the center of this massive star, you have a core which uh, collapses and forms a neutron star with a typical size, something like 12 kilometer and mass, uh, something like 1.4, maybe sometimes two solar masses. So neutron stars are especially famous for their huge magnetic fields, uh, ranging from 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 14 Gauss. Uh, and they, these neutron stars usually rotates very fast. Uh, shortest periods is around two milliseconds. So if you observe uh, isolated neutron star, uh, usually you can measure period and period derivative. And uh, this uh, quantities gives you some information about strength of the poloid or dipolar magnetic field. So if you plot these neutron stars on the uh, famous period period derivative uh, diagram, you see a main cloud, which are isolated radio pulsars, and above them uh, there are magnetars, which are one of the most magnetized objects in the universe, and also according to their poloid or dipolar magnetic field. Uh, we also demonstrate a range of uh, different uh, phenomena, such as uh, flashes, outbursts, which are probably related to their magnetic fields, also magnetic fields uh, hidden in the uh, crust in the sense it could be a strong toroidal magnetic field or small scale poloidal magnetic fields. Another interesting objects here are central compact objects uh, where poloidal dipolar fields are measured based on how uh, neutron stars slow down are not as big, where it could be 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11 Gauss, but uh, they demonstrate uh, uh, a lot of excessive heating, which is probably related to presence of hidden uh, magnetic fields in the crust. So now in my research, we solved these two coupled uh, partial differential equations using uh, power decode. So it's uh, um, spectral decomposition for angular uh, variables and finite difference scheme for radial direction. The first equation is a magnetic induction equation. On the right-hand side, there are three terms. The last term is uh, simply a decay of the magnetic field due to the ohmic losses because uh, crust of the neutron star has a finite conductivity. Uh, the middle term is a whole evolution which relates uh, different components of the magnetic field, large scales with small scales and poloidal and toroidal components together. Uh, the first term is a Birman battery, and it's usually uh, quite a small term, so uh, it could generate some additional magnetic field if there is externally imposed thermal gradient. For example, if uh, there is a hot spot formed because of some magnetospheric currents. But in our simulations, it's a quite small term. Uh, second equation is a thermal diffusion equation. Again, at the right hand side, we have three terms. Uh, the middle term is uh, ohmic decay because magnetic field or currents decay, uh, some energy is released in in some energy is released as a thermal heat. So this heat is added to the crust. Uh, the first uh, term is anisotropic uh, heat uh, diffusion. Uh, the most efficient agent to transport heat and electricity inside the crust are electrons, and electrons cannot really move uh, in direction orthogonal to the magnetic fields when magnetic fields are so strong. That's why heat is effectively transported along the magnetic field lines. And the last term is again Birman battery term. So as for boundary condition, we use upper boundary condition as a force free because uh, density of charged particle in magnetosphere is usually much, much smaller than density of electrons in the crust. Uh, for uh, temperature, we use uh, black body emission. Uh, so uh, all the heat which uh, reaches the surface is emitted as a black body emission. In our uh, original model, in more complicated models, which we are computing now, we use a magnetized uh, atmosphere model. And besides this, there is a heat blanket layer, uh, which uh, where the gradient of the temperature uh, is huge. Uh, so that's why uh, in the uh, 
crust of the neutron star, we usually have temperatures around 10 to the 8. Kelvin and these temperatures are much smaller at the visible part in the atmosphere. They are around 10 to the 6. So for the lower boundary condition, we use Meissner uh, condition. So uh, magnetic field, we assume that magnetic field was expelled from the core. And in our initial models, we used no, no cooling condition. Now we assume what neutron star cools down because of the neutrino emission. So here is a simplest model when there is a simple dipole void of magnetic field as the initial condition. There is no toroidal magnetic field. In this case, we see what um, uh, poles are colder and equator is hotter because equator is uh, thermally isolated mostly from the core and a lot of uh, heat is released around the magnetic equator because ohmic decay of the magnetic field. Uh, this configuration is axially symmetric. Uh, anyway, um, uh, we do expect a presence of some toroidal magnetic field in a realistic neutron star because uh, we think what uh, magnetic field was amplified due to the dynamo at the proto-neutron star stage uh, when uh, core was collapsing and cooling down, but it was cooling down in a sense uh, from uh, ionosphere kind of a surface, uh, which is transparent for, sorry, for neutrino, from neutrino sphere, uh, which is kind of a surface which is transparent for neutrino, a layer which is transparent for neutrino. But uh, deep inside, a proton neutron star is not transparent uh, for neutrino, so it cannot cool down because of the neutrino emission. But heat is released everywhere in the proton neutron star, and in order to deliver this heat towards the neutrino sphere, a lot of uh, convection has to be developed inside the proton neutron star, and uh, possibly uh, this is a place where dynamo could operate, and this dynamo could amplify. Uh, poloid or magnetic field, and of course, it could generate a lot of the toroid or magnetic field. So here are some of our results uh, when uh, most of the magnetic field energy is concentrated in the large-scale toroid or magnetic field. In this case, uh, the magnetic equator is shifted in the one of the hemisphere, which uh, hemisphere depends on what is the orientation of our large-scale toroid or magnetic field. We also see some kind of a filamentary structure, uh, especially in the thermal map. This filamentary structure is related to instability of the toroidal magnetic field in the neutron star crust. Still, uh, this uh, hot region, uh, it's quite large and it's mostly axially symmetric. Uh, what else we can do? We can introduce some misalignment between uh, poloidal and toroidal magnetic field. In this case, uh, we form a single hot spot, which is quite small. Of course, uh, we still see a lot of um, these fingering structures, again, the stability of the toroid or magnetic field. Uh, but still, this uh, single hot spot uh, could possibly affect how we observe these neutron stars. And of course, in order to say anything about what would be an observation of such a neutron star, we need to model how observation in, is performed. So typical neutron star has the orientation of rotation axis and when a magnetic field could be shifted at a certain angle um, in respect to this rotational axis. Uh, as well, when we have an X-ray sat satellite, it, had some, it has some inclination I towards the rotational axis. So if there is a region uh, which is much hotter at the surface of the neutron star, it emits more X-ray photons and these X-ray photons propagate in a curved uh, space time and essentially reach satellite at some point. So in order to get uh, a variation of intensity over one rotational period or a wide curve, we have to integrate all photons which uh, reach a satellite from a visible hemisphere which is slightly larger than uh, in a normal case when um, uh, gravity is not as strong. And when uh, we perform some rotation on a small angle and uh, repeat this procedure once again. So this is an example of a wide curve which we get for a case when um, toroidal magnetic field is as strong as the poloidal magnetic field and uh, atmosphere is not magnetized. 
So in this case, a uh, path fraction could reach up to um, something like 40%. And a uh, wide curve is asymmetric around the minima. And of course, wide curve depends a lot on exact orientation of the neutron star, which is often unknown. So it uh, possibly could uh, allow us to uh, constrain orientation of the neutron star in the future. So what we uh, do next, we go into archive of X-ray observations and uh, looked at uh, wide curves of modeling Jarsen questions. And uh, apparently uh, with our simulations, we can describe 10 out of 19 magnetizing questions. In some case, we need a kind of symmetric wide curves as on the right hand side of the, this picture. In this case, uh, orientation of polydo and toroidal field uh, coincide. And in some cases, uh, wide curve apparently has some uh, non symmetry. And in this case, uh, we used uh, our models with misaligned polydo and toroidal magnetic field. In our more modern uh, models, uh, where we included the magnetized atmosphere, the main difference is essentially appearance of extremely cold region along the magnetic equator. Because again, uh, due to the uh, magnetic field, which is um, uh, parallel uh, towards the surface, heat uh, has a lot of problem transporting in this direction. Uh, so, and the last result which I want to present today is a case when uh, Dynamo uh, failed to generate a large scale poid or dipolar magnetic field, and instead it possibly could generate multiple arc of the magnetic field with size comparable to the size of the crust. So, large scale, sorry, a small scale uh, multipolar magnetic field. We also performed numerical simulations for magnetothermal evolution. And in this case, we see what a uh, neutron star surface is uh, patchy and uh, at any given orientation, we see multiple patches of the hot and uh, cold surface. Uh, so it means what if we try to prepare a wide curve for this neutron star, we cannot really get a large uh, pulse fraction or large amplitude of these variations in intensity. And uh, this is quite similar to what is observed in central compact objects because uh, for multiple central compact objects, uh, this amplitude is really restricted by 10 or 5%. So overall, our uh, simulations for magnetothermal evolution of the neutron star uh, are in qualitative and quantitative agreement with modern observations of magnetizing quiescence. And stochastic magnetic field configurations, uh, which we uh, studied, could describe uh, some central compact objects. As for the future direction, we hope to model on before diffusion in the core of the neutron star and uh, possibly include some heating due to the magnetospheric currents, which are especially relevant for the case of magnetars. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>